Uh, this afternoon, I have been asked to talk to the title, Your Money or Your Life. So, uh, I didn't choose the title, so I was a bit surprised. <clears throat> and the first thing that came to mind was a interesting story I heard when I was in Thailand. I lived in Thailand as a monk for about 17 years. So you hear a lot of stories of the monks of old who used to wander the forests and some of their experiences and what they learned during their wanderings. And there's a story of this old, he must have not been old at the time, but this monk who grew to a very revered teacher, elderly teacher in Thailand. And when he was a junior monk, he was walking in the forest and up along one side of a stream in what used to be some wide tracts of pristine jungle back in the earlier 20th century. And as he was walking, carrying his alms bowl and his umbrella mosquito net and his robes, which were all that monks had when they chose a life of wandering like this, walking along the stream and, and all of a sudden he stops in his track because he sees coming down the other side of the stream a tiger. And he just froze and stopped. Wasn't quite sure what to do at first. Because in, in Thailand, as in India or anywhere they are, large cats like that, they get hungry. And it has been heard that they attack human beings. So he just froze and watched the tiger. And the thought arise, arose in his mind, it's like, if we have any past karmic connection and there's a debt between us, I willingly surrender my life. He may take this life for the sake of mending, making an end of that kama. But if there isn't anything like that between us, then we both go on our way peacefully. And the tiger just looked at him and moved on. <laughs> And that's, that story struck me because where I ordained in Thailand was a, is a forest tradition. So believe it or not, this is a forest tradition. And I believe the design of the temple with these beautiful oak columns was supposed to represent that side of our tradition. And so we regularly do have the opportunity to go out wandering in the forest. And as a city boy, it's interesting. I didn't grow up living in the forests and knowing the dangers of the forest. But it is one thing walking around the forests here in England or in Europe. I grew up in Switzerland. You come across snails and butterflies. There's nothing very life-threatening there. But in Thailand, they do have some wild animals. And so, it makes you consider your position a bit differently. And so I thought that was actually a very beautiful thing that this monk was able to do, sort of to stop in his tracks and look a tiger in the eyes and say, well, if you have to eat me, go ahead. But if not, then be well. It shows an, uh, an ability to look at one's own life and put it in perspective. We're not used to doing that. Usually, your money or your life is a hold-up scenario, and we usually want to give up neither. So, as monks from a tradition where we don't personally hold any money, well, that one's dealt with, and what we have left is our our life. But it's an interesting it's an interesting question because other than sort of seeing that every now and again in a movie, using it just as a reflection, what would happen if I was in a situation like that where someone threatens to take all my belongings or kill me? It kind of puts you face to face with what you're attached to. 
and it's not something something that we enjoy entertaining, the prospect of having to be separated from what we cherish. So in, in uh, Buddhism, in the teaching and the reflections that the Buddha offered us, he encourages us to consider our relationships to our possessions, whether they're material or just this body, life, and to consider what the nature of these things are. Because that relationship we have to our belongings, whatever surrounds us, our clothing, a wallet with money and plastic in there, bank accounts, our houses, everything we own. It's going to be very dependent on those things. And it's really quite a, if you look at it, it's quite a fragile situation that we're in, but we don't often reflect on that. Hopefully for all of us, we may be able to live our lives without being separated from what we like in too brutal a way, but the nature of life is such that we do end up being separated from what we like. There's no guarantee that the money we make will be able to keep. It'll be safe. And economies go up and down, and money, a lot of money, can disappear in a blink of an eye, as it did a decade and a half ago. So in our modern lives, this is the situations we're in. Back in the time of the Buddha, this happened too. And there's a story of a, a very poignant story of a woman who ended up meeting the Buddha, but uh, came across some pretty dire circumstances on her way there. She was married, and she had gone off to live with her husband in the town where he had grown up. And in India, I believe, the tradition back then was when a woman is pregnant, it was customary to, if possible, to go back to her parents' house to give birth. So they already had a little boy, about two years old, maybe three years old, maybe. And uh, she was pregnant with a second child, so they decided with the husband to head back to her home village to give birth. It was a couple days' trip. And on the way, one day, he's sitting, they're sitting by the side of the road, and he sits on a little mound of earth that turns out to be an old termite mound that was empty, in which lived a snake who did not enjoy his house being sat on, came out and bit the man. And the man died from this poisonous bite. So now this poor lady is in quite a bit of distress. Having lost her husband, she still needs to get to her hometown to her parents' house, pregnant, and with a little, a young child. So quite distraught, she heads down the road, comes across a river that's flooded. So now she has this situation where she has to cross the river. She can't easily go across with a child, and as she's kind of considering the situation, the waters break, she gives birth to this little baby. Now it's even worse, she has two babies to get across. And uh, she decides to leave her little boy, the older one, by the shore, telling him to wait for her. She'll go across, put the baby safely on the other side, and come back for the little boy. And when she's halfway through the river, wading through high waters, she turns around to see an eagle swoop down and take the little boy away. And in distress, she panics, and the little baby in her arms sort of gets carried away in the flood. She gets across the river, heads back to her home village, only to hear that her house burned down and both her parents perished in the fire. Now, this sounds like a very improbable story, and I don't know how accurate it is, because we get it from the Buddhist scriptures, 
and sometimes it does seem like things get embellished. But these things happen, and sometimes when uh, misfortune comes, it comes in a group of misadventures. It doesn't always come part and parcel in the way that we can handle it. So by that time she gets to her home village and realizes there are no parents left to go to with her misery. It's just too much for her and she basically loses it. And she starts wandering around crying and ask, crying and asking why did this happen to her and she doesn't take care of herself anymore. Her clothes become all torn up and she ends up just in her kind of crazed wanderings at the entrance of the Jetta Grove, where the Buddha happens to be talking to people, talking about Dhamma. And so, as far as they're concerned, there's this crazy woman trying to come into the Jetta Grove and uh, out of respect for the Buddha teaching, they want to keep her aside. But he hears the commotion and he asks, what's going on? And they say, oh, it's this crazy woman, almost naked, trying to come in here. And he says, no, by all means, bring her here and ask her what happened. And she tells this absolutely distressing story of what happened to her in the last couple of days. And he just tells her, this is the nature of existence. All that we hold dear, we will become separated from. And he might have added something to that to really soothe her and, uh, out of compassion, empathize with her distress, but basically that was the message. And the penny dropped for her. She realized what was happening and that her distress was caused by the idea that this shouldn't happen. And as a consequence of that, she came to peace with her emotions and asked the Buddha if he, she could ordain as a nun in the, with the nuns that were around. And she did and uh, lived a happy life understood the teachings of the Buddha and was considered one of the liberated ones. So it has a happy ending, and after all. But these stories are really, whether they're actually accurate in the details or not, they're really good material for us to reflect on, on our own situations. So I came across a lot of these stories in my early monastic life when I did quite a bit of reading, suttas and stuff like that. And I thought, well, it seems like a really worthwhile thing to think about death. Because as we all know, we're going to die. But it can, it's kind of a notion in the mind. And it's not very often that we actually incorporate it into our daily life, this awareness that this form is impermanent. We're not going to live forever. We assume, we hope, we're going to live until a ripe old age. And for most of us, a large part of the journey to a ripe old age these days is comprised of decent health. So we're living in a situation where we, we feel okay. I mean, aches and pains, and we get sick every now and then, but we do have this notion that generally we're healthy. That's the way it should be. We're alive, we're healthy. We get old, but we still feel young. And as the body ages, we don't always stop and look at what's happening. And yet, these are valuable reflections. It's very interesting, like as monastics and kind of religious people, very frequently monasteries are places people come to when they lose loved ones. And I was surprised how many times people come to the monastery, grandpa, grandma's passed away, and they say we're completely shocked. It's interesting, isn't it? Kind of what world we live in that when elderly people pass away, we feel shocked. And it just kind of goes to show how little we do tend to think of death, 
think of how impermanent this life is. So I started kind of trying, I wanted to incorporate that into my practice. And I remember thinking of one senior monk who's very, very, he likes to encourage people into whatever their area of preferred practice is. So if people like to develop what we call these kind of divine mind states, Brahma Viharas, trying to cultivate attitudes of loving kindness, of compassion, of sympathetic joy, of equanimity, he'll say, yeah, go for it. Everything you do, do it with loving kindness. Wake up with loving kindness. Go to breakfast with loving kindness. Do your chores with loving kindness. Meditate with loving kindness. So cultivating that in all activities from the moment we wake up to the moment we fall asleep. And then he himself had actually used these reflections on death. I'm, I will die, I will die, I will die. So when he was a junior monk, he was going around using that as a mantra. I will die, I will die, I will die, I will die, I will die. And then one day a senior monk kind of saw him and probably had some ability to suss out what was going on. And he looked at him and said, you're not going to die yet. <laughs> he, was too, he was quite young. And I thought that was interesting because it's recommended to consider death, but how we think of death matters. So I started thinking of death and thinking, well, we don't, we don't know when we're going to die. Some people die young, some people die mid-life, mid some people die in their older years. The thing that's certain is we'll die, we don't know when. So I'm there thinking this, kind of sometimes sitting meditation, sometimes walking. And I'm like, yeah, but well, what does that do to me? What does that do for me? It doesn't seem like the reflection just like that actually goes anywhere. It seems like an intellectual exercise. It's like, how do you bring that from this intellectual level down into the heart where it starts having meaning? Where the awareness of death is such that it changes the way you consider what you're doing. And so, I read one very uh, useful bit of advice that some teacher of old had put in writing, who warned that when we think of death, we need to be careful to watch what the reaction is inside that arises when we think of death. If we think of the death of people that we're very attached to, and it makes us worry a lot, and it makes us sad, well then, that's not quite balanced yet. Maybe we're not ready for that kind of reflection. If we think of the death of people we hate, our enemies, and we start rubbing our hands saying, oh, that'll be good riddance, well then, that's not balanced either. If we think of death of people we don't know on the other side of the planet, people die, and the result is indifference, well, then that's not useful either. So to notice when we think of death, what, what, what does it do? So we're not thinking of death for the sake of it, we're thinking of death because we're trying to bring it in to awareness, into consciousness, in such a way that it informs our choices, our attitude, our priorities, how we go about our lives. And the, the Buddha's own advice about how to contemplate death is very interesting. Back in those days, uh, they would burn bodies on charnel grounds. And in India, where Hinduism is the main religion, they also have their uh, religious rules that dictate how to dispose of bodies. So I think most bodies can be cremated, but there are certain cases, like people who died from a snake bite, pregnant women, I hope I'm not getting this wrong, but um, certain situations people don't get cremated and the bodies are left in charnel grounds in the open air to rot and people just come and leave the bodies and leave and whatever happens to the body is not their concern anymore. And uh, the Buddha encouraged monks to go to charnel grounds 
to look at those bodies that are burning, the bodies that are left to decompose, and just spend some time there, living in the charnel grounds. And as they see these bodies, to reflect, these people used to be the way I am now. And the way they are now, those bodies, is the way this body will end up. And that's a very interesting reflection, especially with the caveats that I just mentioned. Not thinking of death in a way that makes us worry and grieve about those who are, we love who are not yet dead. Thinking of the death of enemies or people we don't know, which leaves us indifferent. This is really bringing it home in a way where we're looking at what the nature of bodies are and watching bodies of people who have died and going, as they are, so will I be. As I am, so I, so were they. So in what Banana Chat, in the monastery where I ordained, they do have a tradition of bringing, the villagers bring the deceased to the monastery, and we do the ceremonies, the funeral ceremonies, and they put the coffin on top of two brick walls that has, have stairs going up on each side. And underneath the coffin, they pile up firewood. The coffins are open, and uh, they don't tend to make up bodies. They just leave them as they are. Usually cremate them between four to seven days of the death, depending on the season, the weather, and if, the, if it's hot and humid, the bodies will tend to start decomposing fast and smelling at home. And uh, it's interesting to see how to, to witness all of this, because you're faced with the reality of the nature of the body very quickly. One moment, Pita people are our relatives in our houses. We love them, we hate them. We spend time with them, we run away from them. And then all of a sudden something happens, and it's a dead body. And if you leave it at home for too long, it gets very smelly. <laughs> and the, the, re, the simple reality of this is very, very powerful. And in a very ordinary way, it really brings home the nature of this body. It kind of stops you in your tracks, like all, the, all your usual concerns and worries and trains of thoughts in your daily life, and then all of a sudden, this happens. And then the people, the villagers, usually bring the bodies to the monastery in the coffin in a long procession and spend a bit of time together at the monastery. They'll offer robes and flowers and incense to the monks. Uh, usually one of the monks will give a reflection. And then at the end, they all have these little uh, flowers that are made of shavings of wood that are curled and made, made to look like little flowers. Everybody's given one, and you have the opportunity to walk up the stairs, up to the coffin, this open coffin with his body, lifeless body in it, and just take a few seconds and put this thing in there. And everybody has their own reflections there. But everybody is given the opportunity just to witness this. This is what the body, what happens to the body. And then they set fire when everybody's come around. The relatives usually light the fire, and then everybody leaves. And in Thailand, it is quite a superstitious society overall. And they don't like to stay around because they want the ghost of the relative to stay away from the village, to stay away from home. Even if it was someone they loved very much when they were alive, their fear of ghost is greater, and they don't want the ghosts to be around. And some people are so superstitious that they'll take a lot of the belongings that this person used during the life, down to the mattress they slept on, their clothing, a lot of their, some of their furniture, like their favorite armchair, 
and they'll stick all of that into the fire because they're afraid that the ghost might be attached to those belongings and if that stuff stays at home, the ghost will find its way back to haunt the house and they don't want that. So just generally they come to the monastery, do all the funeral ceremonies and then they all leave. And as monks we have the opportunity to now be with this fire, intense fire, burning with a coffin on top and it's I'd never seen that before. The coffin very quickly falls apart, it's made of wood, and the body falls from the coffin on top of the stack of firewood. And at first the fire is so intense, you're not sure what you're, what you're seeing, what you're looking at, but very quickly a lot of stuff burns up and you're left with this burning, this body that's burning. And it it imposes a kind of silence in the heart, in the mind, when you sit by that and just watch it. And bring to mind this reflection of the Buddha just a few days ago. This person was alive, the way we all are here, going about their business. And now this is what happened to the body. Something similar is going to happen to this one when this body reaches the time to die. That's what's going to happen to this body. And that stops the mind in its track somehow. And then a few days go by and we're back to our routine in the monastery and we kind of forget all about it. And that's interesting to notice how easily we forget. So I started scratching my head and wondering, well, how do we how do we do this kind of thinking about death? And we chant every morning. There's a chant where a part of the chant where we say, "All that is ours, beloved and pleasing, will become otherwise; will become separated from me." And if we let that come back as a refrain in our train of thought, then we start thinking more and more about the fact that in our, in our lives, here and now, we are rather fond of these bodies attached to them. If someone comes up to us and says, your money or your life, I'd rather separate from neither, but if you have to, take my money. I'll keep the life. Thank you very much. And then it really puts into perspective like how we consider this life of ours. I happened to grow up as a Buddhist. My mother was a Buddhist and so very young, as a young child, four years old, I started getting these notions of rebirth or reincarnation as it's often talked about. So I grew up with this kind of cosmology that this life happens within a string of incarnations. There were previous lives, then there's this life, and what the Buddha teaches is how to make an end of rebirth, so this could be the last one, but possibly there will be more. And it kind of puts it in the bigger picture, and in a way that's very comforting, because you say, oh well, I am attached to this life, but there'll be another one, it's okay. <laughs> And it's interesting to just see that tendency in the mind to seek comfort and reassurance in terms of uh, we really are attached to life. But then thinking in terms of the Buddha's teaching, he explains what the attachment to life is, what fear of death comes from. Fear of death is basically the fear of this body not being available anymore. And so we're attached to it, we don't want it to end, we want it to go on forever. And yet, we know it won't. So most of the time, it's kind of an unpleasant reality, so we shove it aside and get on with our lives. But then we, when we come, to, we want to consider it, it's interesting to see how the mind is, keeps trying to reach out for reassurance and comfort. Still in terms of, well, if this body breaks down in my hands while I'm using it, I can always get another one, go back to 
a supermarket and buy another one, the big supermarket of samsara, get another body, maybe the next one won't have the problems this one has. It'll be taller or shorter or fitter or whatever. Maybe next time around I won't have to be faced with the difficulties I had this slide this time around. And we can kind of imagine a lot of things. So I'm, forgive me if I'm talking from this perspective of sort of reincarnation. Not everyone has that as a kind of cultural, religious background. Some people were raised and told that there's just this one life and after it you either go to hell, to heaven, or spend a bit of time in purgatory. But basically it's the one life, or maybe there's nothing before, there's nothing after. But all of those are really more kind of philosophical considerations. Because even having been raised as a Buddhist and finding this kind of reincarnation, the bigger picture of reincarnation kind of makes sense, and yet the reality is I don't know. I don't remember past lives, so I can't rest knowing that there is rebirth. It's a notion, it's an idea. And so whatever the belief is, the reality is, this relationship to life. I cherish my life, I don't want to lose it. What the Buddha teaches us, and one of the things that Lom Paul Sumedho, our teacher here, repeats to us again and again, he keeps pointing back to consciousness as part of this experience, of this experience. We have a body, we have a mind, each one of us. And we experience life through it. So the body is these things sitting down here. And then the mind is all the stuff happening in the realm of memories and thinking and emotions and awareness. And that's a very interesting one to bring into this reflection on death. Because in terms of consciousness, I mean, we don't usually really know what consciousness is. A lot of people have various notions about what consciousness may be. But one thing is sure, as Lumpur likes to point out, if we ask anyone, are you aware, are you conscious, the answer is yes. But what is that? And so if there's this body, modern science tends to tell us, or modern science is looking for consciousness in the brain, assuming that's where it is, but not really knowing. It's a little bit like looking for your car keys in your bedroom, assuming that that's where you left them, and forgetting that they might be anywhere, really, not necessarily in the bedroom or in the living room. So this, what is this consciousness? And it's very useful to use this reflection on consciousness as this part of the experience which knows. It's the ability to know that we're seeing. Like when you open your eyes, we see each other. So the, the body has these organs, there's light, so Light reflects back, and then that's, there's that part of seeing, which knows we're seeing, we're hearing, smelling, tasting. We have sensations in the body, sitting, feels like this. And in terms of the mind, it's that part which knows that we're remembering, that we're thinking, that we have moods and emotions, they arise, and consciousness is that which knows them. Now, what the Buddha is pointing to is that this consciousness is not something that's created. It's just only ever here and now, and it knows. But it's not like the body, or like memories and thoughts and emotions. 
is something that has not been created, it's just present, it's not personal. And all of that be can become a little bit complicated if we're not used to reflecting on consciousness. It's like, uh-oh. <laughs> because awareness is that within which all our experiences arise. Thinking is something that we experience in consciousness. So consciousness is like the space within which these things arise and cease. So the body, our experience of the body, arises and ceases in consciousness. All five senses, all our experience of the five senses arise and cease through consciousness, in consciousness. Thinking arises and ceases. Thinking is not permanent. But the awareness, the consciousness of thinking, the consciousness part is always there. Conscious, thoughts arise and cease, and yet consciousness doesn't vanish when the thought ceases. And so that puts us in a situation where the body is in consciousness and the mind is in consciousness. And awareness, this ability to know, is like the space in which these things arise and cease. So we're, we're able to kind of start noticing these things and paying attention to these experiences that arise and cease in consciousness. And the more we watch them and pay attention to the consciousness, the awareness part of experience, you start realizing awareness, no matter what the experience is, awareness is always here. So if the body arises and ceases in consciousness, it's born, it lives and then it dies, but consciousness does not die. Now that's interesting, because it means that that could be a refuge. If we develop a relationship to consciousness, that that becomes home, then we have somewhere safe to be where this body can come and go, and when it goes it doesn't matter so much because we're safe. If the body is our refuge, then when it dies, the refuge goes, and we're not, we don't feel safe. It's not a refuge, because the refuge gets swept away in the flood. But if consciousness does not, then consciousness can be that refuge. And that puts a different spin on our relationship to life, to this body. So in, this, in the spirit of these monks of old who used to go and wander in the jungles in Thailand, when I was staying uh, in central Thailand in a monastery called Wat Ratanawan, it's right up against one of the largest natural uh, parks of Thailand, and there's large tracts of forests, and they have elephants. There's still a tiger that's seen, can be seen every now and again, but uh, the forests have shrunk so much that the natural habitat for some of these large animals doesn't really allow them to sustain their normal lifestyle. But anyway, we had the opportunity to go every now and again, every year, up into the, mount into the mountains on top of the hills, and spend about 10 days in the forest. So it takes about a four to, six, four to six hour walk from the end of the road to climb into the hills and be into the forests. And you get to this very beautiful plateau on top, which has streams and forests. And uh, there's one spot that we usually always go to and sort of scatter, scatter in the forest around there. And what we do is uh, we kind of string a piece of tie a piece of string between two trees and hang from that this open umbrella, which is about this wide. And on that, we affix a mosquito net, which hangs down to the floor. So we go and find a suitable spot in the forest that's a little bit away from the stream, in case, just in case there's a, a heavy rain 
and the swell, the stream swells that were away from that, and uh, some were shaded, so the, during the heat of the day we're not sitting in the sun, and uh, something that's not covered in roots and knobs and rocks, so you, you, when you lie down you're more or less comfortable. But it's basically camping, and uh, the fun side of camping is that you're out in nature, but it always comes with some measure of discomfort that you're usually willing to put up with because of the, how nice it is to be in nature. And so it's really interesting to see our habit to seek security as such that even monks who ordain and aspire to follow this path to freedom come into the forest and they're all huddling together in a small area so they're not too far from each other. Because it's the forest. You don't know what's out there. At night, there are some elephants around, so the, the walk into the hills, into the forest, you come across these big mounds of elephant dung, so you know they're around. And you, everybody's heard stories of elephants in the mating season, they, some of them go a bit wild and can just go on a wild stampede and crush everything on their way. So once you're in the forest and all that's separating you from all these dangers is a mosquito net that's maybe half a millimeter thick, you feel vulnerable. And so naturally we tend to seek a sense of security by huddling together. So most of the monks kind of will stay within seeing, within sight of each other. And I was thinking of these stories of these old monks and I thought I wanted to test myself. So I left the other monks to do what they did and I walked down almost a kilometer downstream so that I could find my way back following the stream. But also I wanted to see what happens if I'm if I don't have that sense of security, I'm out of sight and I'm far enough also as well that if anything happens to me I can yell my head off and nobody will hear anything. What is that going to do to the mind and how am I going to deal with it? The intention being I'd like to use this for practice. Do I, am I able, if an animal shows up, am I able to do what this old monk did? walking along the stream, sees the tiger and says, eh, whatever, <laughs> can I do that? Or am I just going to soil my robes? <laughs> so I found this really nice little spot by the stream. It had a large flat-ish rock. And so I suspended my, my, my umbrella and my mosquito net above that and put out my bone and my robes there, and then I started walking around a bit, because I do enjoy walking meditation as much as sitting. I find that quite a useful way to meditate. And as I walk around, I see some more elephant dung, and then I see some pretty big poop that's not big enough to be elephant dung, but it's big. And I kind of look at it, and I take a stick, and I poke around a bit, and there's some broken pieces of bone in there. <laughs> so, I don't know, I'm no animal expert, so I couldn't identify what animal spore this was. But it's obviously carnivorous, and it's obviously big. I'm like, okay, this is getting interesting. <laughs> and so I just spent some time sitting under my mosquito net during the day, and then going out and walking a bit in the shade of the trees. I even found in the rocks there was a very naturally carved out area about 20 meters long that was flat enough that it was almost like a natural walking meditation path. And I was like, wow, look at that, the blessings, <laughs> the blessings. And I was really feeling quite happy about it all. And then dusk started coming. And it got darker, and I was walking, walking out there as it was getting darker. I was like, hmm. And then that's interesting, because that's when you see what happens with the mind. Now you're not so sure anymore. And I was feeling a little bit uh, vulnerable, really. And I was like, okay, I have a flashlight, everything's okay. My, my uh, mosquito net is just about 30 meters away, so I'm not lost. Can I just keep walking until it gets dark? I was like, yeah, yeah, I can do it. 
But then the darker it got, the less confident I felt. <laughs> and it's really interesting to watch that, because then you realize, this is we don't choose to feel safe or unsafe, we don't feel to feel confident or not, but this is what happens. So it's kind of putting ourselves in a situation that's going to actually reveal, in a way, where we're at. And I made it until it was dark, but as soon as it was completely dark, I thought, okay, I did pretty well, I'm going to my mosquito net now. <laughs> and I went and tucked myself under that. And it felt really quite ridiculous how safe I felt all of a sudden behind my half a millimeter thick mosquito net. And then with your flashlight and on, or you light a candle, it lights the inside of your mosquito net, and unless there's strong moonlight outside, you're not aware of what's outside anymore. And so now my world is confined to this little thing that's maybe two and a half square meters. I say, like, oh, now I'm safe. <laughs> Knowing that I'm not, but this is, this is what the mind does. And uh, so I tried, I tried to not fall too much for these little strategies that the mind was coming up with in order to feel safe and secure. Because we can do that. And then in Thailand, a lot of the forest monks of old, they relied on a lot of chanting. And they do tell us when we're training that if you do chanting, you chant suttas, you chant the metta sutta, you chant the protective verses and this and that, and they'll protect you in the forest. And I could see the temptation to start doing that and relying on chanting to keep me safe. And I had to remind myself, I didn't come here into the mountains to feel safe. I could just stay in the monastery if I wanted to do that. I want to challenge this kind of fear of death and what happens in the mind and what my refuge might be. And if I find out that I don't have much of a refuge when I'm out in the wild like this, well, maybe I can find one that doesn't depend on chanting or on a mosquito net, or on four solid brick walls and a lockable door, which is usually what is safety for us. And so I just sat there and started contemplating, and it was really interesting to see that very quickly a type of reflecting starts arising in the mind that I can't come up with easily when I am in a monastery like this, and we have these buildings that keep us safe, not just from the sun and the rain and the wind, but they keep us safe from a lot of things. Not many wild animals around here these days in England, so the risk of being gored by a crazy deer with long, sharp antlers is pretty low. <laughs> but still, we, we feel safe. And sort of thinking about how fragile and how vulnerable these bodies are. When we feel this safe, sometimes it is a bit of a challenge, but going out and living in a forest, hours away from the next building, out of earshot, out of sight of the next human being, and looking at what that does to the mind, was very interesting. And resisting the temptation to go to sleep and just go to refuge, go to sleep for refuge and then forget about all the dangers and the temptation to do a lot of chanting because apparently it has a magical way of telling animals you don't mean harm and they'll leave you alone but actually just being willing to sort of experience the fear the vulnerability and in that moment it's like okay so if a tiger does show up and just rips down my mosquito net with one swipe of its paw and claws. What can be my... What thought, what, what can I go to that will allow me to accept death, if that's what happens? What can I do? It's very, very interesting to just see allowing these fears to be what they are. So it's not, I'm not telling myself, oh, I can do it, I'm not afraid. It's no, no. There is fear, and yet, am I able to go to refuge for something else than this body? Because obviously this body then 
would be four feet, it would be the tigers. And just opening up like that, naturally, without having to tell myself to do so, I notice that the mind does come back to this sense of awareness. Because that's all we have left. And what happens after death? Will it be painful or not painful, all of that? I, we can't tell. I didn't know. But more and more, it's, it was pretty obvious just from the situation that the only refuge was this sense of awareness. And there's this very beautiful thing that another monk who was threatened, felt threatened by some big wild animals in the forest, he was thinking when he was facing a tiger, you can have my body, but you can't have that part of the mind which knows, that I'll stay with. And so I kept that in mind. And it's, it's in, really interesting to see that in that situation, just allowing reality to be what it is, really. It's allowing the body to be a vulnerable form, an impermanent form. We use it, and it can be a refuge in some ways, but ultimately it is not. And to be willing to accept that reality and see where that leaves you, it does bring us back to the sense of, okay, well, if this body goes, all, all there is left is this sense of awareness, of knowing. We can be aware of it and we can rest with the knowing part of this body. And that is, does feel reassuring. When I was there in the forest and I stay, we stayed there for 10 days. And that sort of really became the thing that I'd keep going back to. And it felt safe. It felt like something I could trust. And admittedly, I certainly did not feel like an arahant who's free and who can leave his body behind and who's confident of consciousness, awareness as a refuge to the point that every, he can let go of everything, but it had a very definite sense of this is a refuge. This is something worth trusting, worth cultivating. And that experience when I went back to the monastery and I was able to stay in a hut with solid wooden walls or brick walls and you feel safe physically, kind of remembering that and how those conditions really brought to light what you can trust and what you cannot trust, and coming back to that. So, are there any questions anyone would like to ask? Yes. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> Um, there's probably an on button, yes? I'm not sure what microphone they gave you. Yeah, can you hear me? Okay. The, um, <clears throat> I know it's due to speech that you can't say what it is, but um, so when you say taking refuge in consciousness, for most people they would create a duality like that, that is me, and consciousness, I know consciousness, and that you know the you know that du duality, which is a very Christian thing or a Western thing. We're going to make God into a thing, enlightenment into a thing, consciousness into a thing. But so with the Avaita, the seer can't be seen, the hearer cannot be heard, the knower cannot be known. Yet it's known, but not known in a knowing way. You know, you know that that kind of thing. So, um, what you're pointing to cannot be known, but it's known, but it's not known. So, you know, like the Zen say, um, what are you? And you keep answering yourself that Cohen, what am I, what am I? And then you come up with, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And in that not knowing, you know, but it's not you that knows. You know, it sounds a funny way we're talking, doesn't it? So, my, um, 
the thing I wanted to sort of just re bring up or slightly reflect on was the fact that the more you try and know, the less you're going to know. You understand? You know, when you're saying a refuge, most people are going to say, OK, I know they're not knowing, but you don't know they're not knowing. You know, it's trying to get that. I know what you're trying to say, but if you ever took it as a refuge, it wouldn't be a refuge because you would be making it into a conditioned thing, wouldn't you? It's the unborn, the unmade, the unknown that's known through the, you know, if there wasn't a conditioned a knowing and known, there couldn't be an unknowing, unconditioned, un you know that? Mm -hmm. It's getting that across, isn't it, what you're trying to do, but it's almost impossible. It is indeed, because when we're operating from the level of thinking, then we get all caught up and consciousness is that which knows. And it's interesting to look at the way the, the, the different skillful means and the tools that the Buddha gave us to work with in order to kind of get to see this clearly. I mean, a lot of his teachings are just uh, skillful ways of developing understanding. And in terms of thinking, thinking is a dualistic function. And so we'll never get beyond duality with words and concepts and thoughts. And yet, that's the limitation of speech and thinking that we have to contend with when we're trying to communicate this. And in a way, it's not so different from that story of the wise man pointing to the wound with his finger and the fool looks at the finger. And like the hand is not the moon, the finger is not the moon, and yet the gesture points towards something. It's the same with words and with concepts and thinking. All these words the Buddha, what, that the Buddha used to teach, that we use to communicate, they're limited, but they are pointing to something, an experience, the experience of consciousness. And it is very difficult to qualify it and to describe it accurately with words, because consciousness goes beyond words. Words arise and cease. They're created, speech is created. So whether it's the spoken word or thinking, concepts silently in the mind, but it's kind of mental noise, so to speak. These things arise and cease. And yet consciousness is that within which thinking arises and ceases. It knows thinking. It knows the absence of thinking. And then a thought arises, happens, and ceases. And then it knows the end of thinking, and again, no thinking. So the nature of consciousness is not a thinking nature. Thinking is something that arises and ceases in consciousness. It's true that in the West we do tend to attach a lot to duality, and perhaps it's the case that Western societies, being kind of wealthier societies, there's a lot more education than in some other parts of the world, even though like living in Thailand, the monasteries out in the northeast of Thailand, which is considered a rural area, you had people like Ajahn Chah who never went beyond sixth grade primary school in terms of studies. But by the time I became a monk, the lads coming around to the monastery in central Thailand, most of them were from educated backgrounds. They had certainly finished high school, some of them had done university studies, and you realize <clears throat> how much we are trained to think and how much we trust thinking as a tool. And in our training, in our, in our studies, we're taught to trust critical thought. And it is useful, but nobody teaches us, or I don't know if it starts happening these days or not. I hear sometimes in kindergarten and primary school, some teachers start to teach children some mindfulness techniques and that's very, very beneficial because certainly all the education I went through, nobody told me, okay, so there's thinking, 
which is very useful, but it's a tool, and sometimes you need to put it down, or it might drive you nuts. Obsessive thinking, and then we do go nuts. I mean, people go mad with too much thinking. They can't put it down anymore. So consciousness doesn't think. Consciousness is aware of thinking, knows thinking. But it is a refuge in the sense of a relationship to experience, which is consciousness in which experience arises and ceases, in the form of sights, sounds, smells, tastes, sensations in the body and touch, and then in this mental realm, memories, thinking and emotions. So we usually call those, and like there's this Pali term, sankharas, which means things that are created. They're out of certain conditions, something is born, and then it ceases. And conditions. What there are different ways of uh, talking about these things. But let's say we're using the word just conditions or phenomena arise and cease in consciousness. And our usual relationship to our lives, our experience, is we are all conscious, that's a fact, and nobody here can say the opposite. And yet, in our relationship to experience, most of us are investing our interest and our attention in the things that arise and cease in consciousness. And it is a hallmark of spiritual practices <coughs> excuse me, to start paying attention to the consciousness part of that relationship, to objects that arise and cease in consciousness. Like I really like using uh, one part of the Buddha's teaching when he talks about sights, smells, and all these sort of sense doors. He says, for all of these, for sight to happen, you need an object of sight, so now I'm looking at you, so there's that image. You need an organ that's functioning correctly, and you need consciousness. And when all three are present, there is sight, there is eye contact. Now, in investigating that, you can notice how in our daily lives we tend to project out towards the objects. And when we look at each other, and I notice you're wearing a white, black and white t-shirt, it says Vietnam or something on it. And uh, it's got this kind of design, and then I can look at other people. And when I do that, most of the time there's this sense of there is that outside world, and from here I'm looking out there at stuff. And in the Buddha's, in the Buddhist master's teachings from all traditions, they have this way of describing how we tend to send the mind out into the world. The Buddha talked in, at least in the scriptures, in Pali, talks about the asawas, the effluence, is something flowing out. And when you investigate that and try to understand, well, what's he talking about, stuff flowing out? I mean, he's not talking about snot and saliva and all these different things that come out of the body. He's talking about the mind. What is it? And if you use this kind of list format about there's an object of the senses, there's sound, there's the ear, and then there's consciousness. When all three are present, there's hearing. And in that, in that context, what is he talking about? What do the teachers talk about when they say, sending the mind out into the world? And you notice we do tend to do that, to send the mind out to objects of sight, of sound, of smells. Where is that smell coming from? Tastes when we're eating, we kind of look. Notice what the mind does when you, I don't know if you've ever joined us for the meal here. We have all this food that's put out in the kitchen on these serveries. It's a lot of food. And it's very difficult to make a meal out of everything that's on the table. And you're looking at it and the mind is going, ooh, which one should I take? This, look, this looks nice, but that does too, but I can't have everything. And all this stuff gets created in the mind and we're looking out there at all this food. So that's also how we relate to taste. And it's really interesting to notice, okay, well, can I actually place, choose where I place my attention? Because by default, it does seem that we are, the mind is always going out into the world, following the senses. 
And if you consider the mind one of the senses in terms of that organ which perceives memories and thoughts and emotions, then we also go out into those. And we can sit here meditating, we sit down and silently and watch the breath and poof, the mind goes off, it thought of something and it's gone. And sometimes I've been very amused to notice that I can sit here and my mind hears a sound, so it goes out into the room, which reminds me of something else, which I was outside the room. And in less than a minute, I'm thinking of Andromeda, galaxy of Andromeda, which is what, 4.5 light years away. And then I come back, remember the breath. And that's what the mind does. It goes all over the place and comes back and then chases off after something else again. So the six sense doors, the five physical senses and this kind of mental function can I actually choose where I place my attention, where I'm operating from? Because if by default it goes out, attention goes out there, can I choose to come back to the organ? I mean, at the beginning when I was investigating that, coming back to consciousness, kind of like, hello, I don't know what that is. I, did, I, I understood the concept, but the reality of it is like, how do I come back to consciousness? I don't know how to do that. So I just played around with the two, with the objects of sight and sounds mostly, and then the organs. And it's very interesting to notice how different the experience is. If you're looking out at stuff, and your attention is out there on the things that you see, the people, the objects, the trees, whatever, the stars. And then if you come back and place your attention on the eyes, it's in terms of sensations, yeah? All you have to do is blink, and it gives you a sense of this, this are... This is what, where we see from, physically. And if I start placing my attention there, and holding it there gently, then the mind is not going out to the variety and, and diversity of things that are in the visual field. It comes here. And I can still acknowledge seeing. Seeing is still happening, but there's something much more peaceful about it. And as you look at that and you investigate that, what happens in the mind in terms of experience, when the focus of your attention is all the way out there, or when you bring it back here, there's a sense of composure, there's a sense of collectedness. Sometimes it doesn't want to do it, if the habit is very strong to go out there, because that habit is strong, and you rein it in, the horse bucks and doesn't want to. But you find ways of doing it, and eventually you settle here and you realize, wow, this is actually really peaceful. Because when I do let the mind go out, I see a lot of things, some I like, some I don't like, some I agree with, I don't, things I hear people say, and it causes a whole turmoil and chaos of emotions and views and thoughts and memories. And I can argue with the world. And I don't find that happening when I just come back to the eye. And I'm still seeing, like I can look at you and pay attention to all of you and men, women, and Asian and Caucasian and this and that and the other. Or I can just come back here to the sense of the eye is what's doing the seeing right now. And when I come back there, all of a sudden, all those differences between the objects, people, chairs, mats, floor, roof, it's a way of categorizing, identifying, but then it's also separative. And then when you separate things, you classify them. There's bigger, smaller, light, dark, better, worse. You're just creating a lot of business in the mind. When I come back to just the eye or just the ear, I notice the mind doesn't pay attention so much to the details of that experience, and it becomes much more peaceful. And then as you do start investigating the consciousness part of it, and you start relating to this, what is it, just by investigating and ask, you're asking questions, interrogating the experience, so to speak. is like, consciousness is basically that which knows. In this, the five aggregates that the Buddha talks about, sense consciousness, that would be consciousness such as it is experienced through the senses. 
And as such, that experience is impermanent. Seeing is impermanent, it arises and ceases. And that's the senses. But consciousness itself, when it's not considered in relationship to the senses which are impermanent, then consciousness itself, what is that? Is it impermanent? And you start coming back and checking in on that regularly. And you start really getting a sense of this knowing part of experience. And it's whenever you turn, you, you turn back to it, to check in on it, it's always there. When you investigate it, it's always here. Now. It's always available, present, registering the present moment. Whether our attention is out there chasing after stuff or whether it's here is irrelevant. Knowing is aware. And we might not be paying attention to the knowing part, we might be chasing after the objects that arise and cease in this field of knowing, but the knowing is still here. All you need to do is pay attention to it and you notice it is. It just is. So it's, it cannot be known as an object, as something that arises and ceases, because it does not. And that's where thinking starts clashing with the description of it, because in terms of thinking, knowing knows an object. But the reality of it is beyond words. It can know itself, but not as an object. But it is awareness, aware of itself. And in that sense, why the Buddha talked about that as being the ultimate refuge, is because in this realm of our experience, every time we invest into stuff, stuff changes. Whether it's physical belongings, whether it's relationships, family, business, friends, social, relationship to the body, to our views. Our views change, our perception of who we are changes. When we're young children, we don't really know who we are, but we get this sense of, hey, I'm a kid, let's go and play. And then in your teens, you've got about a decade there where life starts getting pretty tough because you can't play all the time anymore. <laughs> you have to kind of go through the school and classes and exams and all of this and that. And by the time you reach your 20s, generally speaking, you have to start earning to survive. You can't just depend on mom and dad for the rest of your lives. And how we perceive ourselves changes according to these conditions. And then in our 30s, it's different. Some of us do this, and then we perceive ourselves as monastics, as monks, nuns. Other people get married, and then their perception is, I'm a husband or a wife, I'm a father. Think of your parents, I'm a child. And so the sense of identity keeps changing. And so, if you prefer being a younger person than an older person, well then, you're going to be separated from what you like. The youngster. So all these things change, and yet what's always here is consciousness. And so, in our relationship to things that change, is where suffering arises. Because we like some, and we don't like other. And what we like, we'd prefer if it stays, and doesn't change, and doesn't cease. And what we dislike, if it could not arise, it would be nice, but if it's arisen, can I get rid of it faster, please? And that's where we create the suffering, through wanting things to last, or wanting to get rid of them. Now, when we come back to consciousness, we're basically coming back home, like in that relationship of, if you just take sight, where we project always out into the world of objects that we see, and it's so varied and diverse, it causes, there's a lot of opportunity for things to be likable or dislikable, to be wanted or diswanted, to create and generate desires, to get, to obtain, to realize, to become, or the opposite, wanting not to get, not to have, not to be, not to become. When you bring it in and just start relating to experience, even just as an exercise, what happens if I come back to the eye, to the ears, to the nose that smells and stuff like that? You realize a lot of that just drops away. And then when you come back further inwards to consciousness and appreciate just knowing, 
Consciousness doesn't actually need conditions to arise and cease in order to just be. There's just awareness. And if an object arises, then there's awareness of an object arising and ceasing. Once the object ceases, then awareness is just present. And there's such a there's an opportunity for contentment there. This is a ground from which suffering does not arise. And that's why we call it a refuge. It's a refuge from suffering. Suffering always arises in relationship to conditions, to sankharas. Is that helpful in the considerations you brought up? Yeah, I think it explains it in a very good way, you know, that you, I think it was Ram Dass wrote, you know, you're never not here. Right. Like, like a cat, you know, more like a cat. And, and like when you said, you know it, but you're not here. You know, that it's, it's so simple, isn't it? Mm. The understanding, it's just, when people say an isness, a suchness, it, it's there, but you're not there, but it's, it, the object's not there, but everything is, you're alive for the first time, aren't you? You're not being just a reactionary creature, you're actually alive. You breathe in and the moment is open and receptive. Instead of being judged or changed to your way of thinking. I think it's what, whenever I listen to Arjun Samadhi, it's the thing that always struck me, it always pulled me in that he knew that from experience, not from a text. That he was pointing, he always said, you know, I'm pointing to something. But he never said what he was pointing to because he would have ruined it, you know. You know that, you're around him all the time. Yes, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's really worth noticing how, how we can think about consciousness, we can talk about consciousness. But when the Buddha talks about the characteristics of the Dhamma, it's well expounded by the Blessed One. He, he really taught as thoroughly as he could. It's apparent here and now. It's timeless. It invites investigation. It's leading onwards in the investigation or inwards. And the last part is to be experienced individually by the wise. And at the end of all the talking, that's what you're left with, is just knowing. Just the knowing. It's that simple. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Yes. I think you could use this one. I was just telling my children here that I've... Um, I'm, very, I've I'm very impressed that you... You're still here and you're not sleeping. <laughs> that I've been here, the first time I came here was almost 30 years ago, when I was 19. And um, our first year at my university in England. And, and I did a retreat some time after that, a couple of years with Long Po Samedo in my early 20s. I don't know whether I was doing it properly, or I look back and I think I wasn't doing it properly. But I knew all those years, and I came to stay too as a guest, and did several retreats here. And all those times, I knew that it wasn't for me. I needed to move my body. Mm. I needed to, it, it didn't work. And yet, I did come and hear the Dharma talks until I became very unwell in 2012 and uh, was absent for 10 years. And this is, I returned a couple of years after lockdown. During lockdown, um, we were locked down, so I did started yoga intensively 
five days a week. And then when lockdown was over, I joined a club that did Iyengar yoga. And that's when I noticed, I've been doing Iyengar yoga for over a year and a half, including the year of lockdown, which would be three years and a half. I noticed that there was a huge change. Each time I sit down at meditation, I, hear, I would notice a buzzing all surrounding my body. And I remember when I was only 22, during question time at the retreat, I didn't say anything, I was so young, I didn't really know what I was doing. Um, but I did remember an older woman during the question and answer with, in a small group with Ajahn Sumedho saying that her experience of meditation was she felt an energy surrounding her. I was clueless and I thought, oh, that sounds interesting. It's not certainly happening for me. Um, but something's happening now. After 30 years and after my instinct that I knew I needed movement, I knew that the sitting meditation was not working for me and it just didn't work. And I didn't meditate for about 15 years. Um, and also other things have been happening. I noticed that uh, during my dream, uh, dre dreaming, I know I'm dreaming. There's a voice that's saying, you're dreaming. And I wake up and I said, yes, I was dreaming. Oh. So I'm, I'm, I'm wondering what's going on. I also noticed that when I meet somebody that I haven't met before, it's happened a few times, more than a few times, that I, I realized that I sense that she's, somebody, this person's not well. And then I discover later on, three months later down the line, actually she has a diagnosis of cancer. I, I'm quite surprised, something's going on. Um, so what I'd like to know is the role of the body and consciousness and, um, and, and could you say more or reflect more and help or give any pointers of what else I could do in meditation and, and the focus on the body? The body, the body is really a restless form. I mean, the, the Buddha talks about these four postures that we use. I, either we're walking or running, or we stand, or we sit, or we lie down. That's it. The body is always in one of these postures. And yet, because it's a changing condition, it's always changing, how long can we sit down before it starts aching? Or we get restless and we need to change postures, we need to stretch. So we get up and we walk around a bit. And how long can you do that before you want to sit down again? And when you're standing, walking, sitting down all day, you get to the end of the day, you want to lie down. The body needs rest. You wake up in the morning, you hit the snooze button, if you can, <laughs> if you have the chance to do that, say on Sunday morning, you hit snooze and you turn around and then you hit it again. After a while you get restless, you want to get up out of bed and move. That's the nature of this body. It's a really restless package. And so, for each of us, it's going to be different. Some people really do a lot of sitting. <coughs> like um, monks, yeah, in terms of using postures for meditation, because you brought up the retreat format. Um, like Lungta Mahabua in Thailand, he talks about sitting until he had calluses on his backside from sitting so much. That's a lot of sitting. And then there's another uh, senior monk who was of that generation, the first disciples of Lumpuman. So he would have lived in the 20th century, died in the 60s or 70s at the latest. He was known for walking all the time. His whole life, the day he ordained, he just did walking meditation all day. Woke up at three in the morning, walked until it was time to go on alms round. On alms rounds, he walked, came back, sat down to have his meal. And as soon as he was done, he was on his walking meditation path again until mid-afternoon, then he'd grab a broom, sweep around his hut, tidy stuff up, refill the foot bath, go and get some drinking water. So he's always moving around, sit down, have a cup of tea, walk some more, all the way into the evening, late at night, 
10, 11 at night, he'd lie down on the walking path if it's not raining. So it's a large part of the year in Thailand. And he'd just close his fist and that would be his pillow. And he'd sleep and as soon as he woke up, he was walking again. And apparently he lived his whole monastic life like that. That was it. He did not sit. That's what worked for him. So you have to, you have to know yourself and what works for you. And that's what worked for him. It doesn't mean that we can't try out different things and investigate them and just... Ultimately, the freedom is, and the freedom, liberation is really lib freedom in the mind from all conditions. Because I'm sure that as he got older <coughs> and the body got weaker, I mean, I look after an 80-year-old, 89-year-old person, he cannot walk all day. <laughs> the body is not able to do that anymore. And so at some point, things change in the body. Energies change, strength changes, restlessness changes. Whatever, whatever it is that this particular package is, and is different for everyone, we have to learn what, what is happening and what tools can I use, what works, what doesn't work. So you experiment, and when you find something that works, do that. So, from what you're saying, I mean, obviously a few years have gone by since your 20s and the early retreat, but then also you've done a lot of yoga, and I'm sure you've become aware of the body in a different way. And uh, awareness, the, the level of mindfulness develops in such a way that the subtlety that registers in things that are happening in consciousness, that changes as well. And as we practice and discover what stillness may be, then part of the experience is we inevitably are going to start experiencing more silence. We may not notice it as that, but we experience it. And Conscious awareness is basically, its nature is silent. And it's interesting what you said about the dreams, like sometimes you're, you're aware that you're dreaming, and then this thought arises, you're dreaming, and that wakes you up, and you realize, yes, I was dreaming. And it's interesting to see how much we, like th this, what this reminded me is how Lumpur Sumedho is always encouraging us to trust awareness, and you're aware in your sleep, and just most of the time we haven't developed awareness to such a degree that we can notice subtle things. And when the body shuts down, because we're used to operating with consciousness and awareness at the level of the senses, sense consciousness, if we don't train to start recognizing awareness and consciousness as something within which senses operate, then our, our, our relationship to consciousness is always going to be sense consciousness. And then when we sleep, we're unconscious. Because that's our experience. So people like to ask, so what happens to consciousness when we sleep? Nothing happens to consciousness when you sleep. Awareness is there. The body falls asleep. And because we haven't developed anything else in terms of awareness beyond sense, consciousness, then nothing's happening. And then you dream. But So as you start developing meditation, and yoga is developing meditation, your awareness becomes, picks up on more subtle things. Things that are not necessarily physical or verbal. And the Buddha has a way of <coughs> describing, excuse me, the Buddha has a way of describing what can happen beyond the senses and beyond the realm of thinking as something that cannot be fathomed. The ability the mind has outside of the senses and outside of thinking is unlimited. And there's no way to measure it and categorize it and say, okay, this is it, there's nothing else. So what happens when you're dreaming is 
awareness is become more sensitive, and then dreaming is an activity of the mind. And you start noticing it, you're aware, ah, this is happening. And then the thought that comes up and describes it kind of takes you out of sleep. What happens when you meet someone and you intuit that something is not right, and then a few weeks or months later you hear they have difficulties? That's the nature of the mind. And you're welcome to try to explain it, but you don't need to. As much as kind of realize, this is what the mind does. Like when I was staying in, uh, with a friend in northern Thailand, we heard of this monk nearby whose meditation was going quite well, and he started his own little hermitage, and his meditation was going quite well because he was on his own without too much stimulation and interaction. And then one evening he's sitting meditation like this, and he sees this really vivid image of a red Mercedes-Benz with three people coming out with all this nice food. Next morning he comes back from alms round. What rolls into the monastery? A red Mercedes-Benz. Three people come out, plenty of nice food. He's like, oh, my meditation is going rather well. <laughs> I saw something. And then a couple of days later, something else happens. Again, the next day, he, he had a, 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 some, a, some image came up in the mind in meditation. Next day, it happens. It happens nine, ten times in a row. So he's starting, he's starting to be seriously impressed with his meditation. I, I can know things that are going to happen before they happen. Until one evening, he sees one of those vivid images, and the next day nothing happens, nor the rest of the week, nor the rest of the month. It never came, it never became a reality. And he realized, he didn't, he didn't know why the mind was bringing up these images. It's not like tomorrow's lottery numbers have been determined somewhere up there in heaven, and if you can, if you know just which registry to go up, you can read it, come down and tell your buddies and you all get rich. Or you can go somewhere and it's written, a red Mercedes-Benz. What happens in the mind? What you can know is that it happens. And that's what I like so much about Lumpa's very simple reminder. It's like this. It's an absolute gem, that thing, because it really brings you back to just acknowledging and accepting. It's like this. You may know or not know why. You may agree or disagree, wanted or not wanted, approve or disapprove, condone. All of that may be the case, and yet it still is the way it is. And it's much a much simpler way of relating to life and our experience to be able to just acknowledge that. Otherwise you get caught up in trying to understand it, and then one person gives you one explanation. Ah, that sounds like nonsense. But someone else says something that really makes sense, and you pursue that. and You're just creating stuff in the mind to attach to the way it is. And it's not necessary. And then if you're willing to accept things the way they are, so when, like this monk who had these images coming up in the mind, in, when things like that happen, you can say, oh, look, this sense that someone's unwell has arisen. You don't know if it's true or not. It might, it might not. What you can say is, oh, okay, this has arisen. Or this monk can say, oh, this image of a red car, three people, nice food has arisen. And there can be the tendency to believe it or to wish for it to become true because he'd been eating sticky rice with bananas for three weeks and he would, he'd like some nice curries and whatnot. And that may all be happening. But in terms of awareness, what you can always come back to, and that's where you learn to trust the awareness part of that whole experience. As you say, all of this may be arising and it might be true, it might be not true, Real, not real. Some people hear voices and they come and say, but are other voices real? At the end of the day, it doesn't matter. If you know that it's just sound, and you acknowledge that, that's all you need to do.
You don't need to make something out of it. Because if you go and believe the voices, well, it could be some amazing deity, deva, angel, you name it, entity, spirit, who's speaking through you, and then you start telling people, oh, be careful, the entity said, or yes, it's okay, go ahead and buy the house, it's safe. <laughs> you can do all of that, and yet even that is not safe, it's not sure. There's one monk in the north of Thailand who is reputed to be an arahant, so everybody goes, oh, and it's cool, it's very good to trust someone who's gone beyond desire. But then he would have a lot of these kind of, what they call nimitas, these images and things that come up in the mind. And he'd speak about them quite freely, and people took them as predictions. And one day he said, oh, there's this uh, dam that's holding a lot of water for agriculture and stuff. It's going to break within three months. It would probably be good at all the villagers who live downstream from it in the valley moved out, because it's, otherwise they're all going to die. It never happened. And you realize even someone who is free from all desire, the mind is still the mind. An image is still just an image. It could be true, it could not be true. And in terms of relating to it, in terms of reality, if we project into it meaning, and you want it to be a real prediction or not a real prediction, you're still messing around with things that arise and cease in consciousness. Whereas if you just come back to consciousness and acknowledge, okay, this is yet just another thing that arises and ceases. True, not true, that's a detail of what arose and cease. But in terms of awareness, it's just something arising and ceasing. It's not reliable either way. And then that becomes your refuge. So what I would recommend is that you, as you, as you notice in your practice that your relationship to walking, sitting, awareness, awareness of dreams sometimes, or if you're picking up on things with people, fine. Watch it, see what happens, and if it has any use, it might, something might be useful. But always come back to it in terms of awareness. It's always still just something arising and ceasing.